Well, hello, good morning. My name is David. I am Young Adults Director here at First Christian, a resident, and most of you guys know me as Afton Worship Leader. In fact, some of you are just now realizing, oh, that wasn't him up there a moment ago. <laughs> that was my brother, Jonathan, who did an absolutely uh, amazing job. We are both results of our, our family's faithfulness in uh, raising us in the fear and admonition of the Lord and your faithfulness to come alongside them and help raise us into men who, um, who love and serve Jesus. So I am grateful for that. Thank you. Keep discipling your own kids and helping others do the same. Tommy is out of town this week. I am humbled to be here uh, and I'm grateful that we are a place that mutually submits to the authority of God's word, which is the thing that does the work, which is breathed out by God. It's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. We are going to be studying God's word as we do every week. And please test every word I say by this authority to which I pray I am faithful. Today is week six in our New City Catechism series, as you saw, um, Basic Christian Beliefs in 52 Weeks. And our question today, as Mark mentioned, it kind of flows in natural procession from the last two weeks where we've discovered that we were created to glorify God, that that's our purpose, that's why we're here. And so it makes sense to ask, okay, if that's why we're created, how can we glorify God? And here's the answer we're going to be seeing from the scriptures today. Let's say it all together. I think we've got that on the screen. The answer right before that. Ah, how can we glorify God? We glorify God by enjoying him, loving him, trusting him, and by obeying his will, commandments, and law. And here's this week's memory verse from Deuteronomy 11, 1. Let's say it together, reference first, and then the verse. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. Today we're going to be looking at a larger context of that in Deuteronomy. So you can go ahead and open your Bibles or on your app or whatever and be flipping to Deuteronomy 10. We'll look through 10, 12, all the way through 11, 1. So turn there, we'll read it, we'll pray together, and then we'll dive into uh, studying it deeper. Let's read together Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 11, 1. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but that you fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens and the earth and all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples, as you are this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you are sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him, you shall hold fast to him, and by his name you shall swear." He is your praise. He is your God who has done these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. Let's pray together, friends. Father, we recognize our need to be fed by your word this morning. We recognize our need to live lives to your glory. And so we pray in an act of dependence on you as our only hope. We pray that you would help us this morning see who you are and trust in your perfect, holy, 
character. That you would help us understand our purpose was to glorify you. And that as we glorify you, we are also living out what is for our good. And may in creaturely love-driven submission to you, may our lives be shaped into people who bring you glory in everything. So we pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Who did you want to be growing up? Think on that for just a moment. Who did you want to be? For my brother and I, it was Walker, Texas Ranger. And I think we have a... <laughs> There's Jonathan. You'll picture him different now. Uh, this imitation was kind of natural for us as kids. In fact, I'll even, I still imitate others in a way, though it's not roundhouse kicking bad guys in the back of my yard um, each day. But imitation is somewhat natural for us. What's important here is making sure that you're imitating someone worthy of imitation. Today, we'll be seeing what it looks like for us to imitate or image the only one who is worthy of it. Let's catch up to speed on Deuteronomy. Again, we'll be in Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 11. Deuteronomy was written 40 years after the Israelites had left Egypt. They hadn't yet gone in and taken, uh, taken the land of Israel, so this is before Joshua's conquest. And it's an exposition of the four first books of the Bible, the four prior books of the Torah. I say this for two reasons. One, it's kind of rehashing a bunch of information we've already been given. So we're hearing some of the same stories again with some more context and application for us. But also because Deuteronomy at the very beginning, in chapter 1, verse 5, says itself, Moses undertook to explain this law. And so what we're seeing play out is Moses explaining the law to this new generation. And the first 11 chapters of Deuteronomy summarize Israel's story with a series of passionate sermons in which Moses calls on the new generation to be faithful to the covenant. So in chapter 10, verse 12, where we dive in, Moses begins compelling the Israelites, who were God's people. Remember, he delivered them from Egypt. They were God's people. He compels them to live lives to his glory. Note that this is why Moses is speaking to God's people. He had chosen and delivered them, and that's why we'll see they can live lives to his glory, and they should desire to. And quick reminder of our catechism answer before we dive in, we glorify God by enjoying him, loving him, trusting him, and by obeying his will, commandments, and law. So let's dive into our text, Deuteronomy 10, 12. First couple words, it says, and now. This is because Moses had just prior been recounting a bunch of Israel's history. So this and now kind of acts as a transition statement where he's now talking to this new generation directly. But it's also saying in light of everything you just heard in the history of Israel, which particularly he was pointing out, God has been faithful even though you've been disobedient, Israel. And now, Israel... What does the Lord your God require of you but that you fear the Lord your God, which is this reverent obedience, recognizing who he is in comparison to who we are. It says but you, that you fear the Lord your God to walk in all his ways, which just note, that's imitation sort of language. Follow, walk in the way that God tells you to walk, to love him, which is key to understanding this passage, and the next phrase is going to help parse that out a little bit more. To love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now that's a phrase that may be familiar to some of us. It's Moses hearkening back to Deuteronomy 6, which is kind of the famous centerpiece of this whole section in Deuteronomy. It's called the Shema. Let me read it because it's really helpful in our interpreting this. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. That whole uh, chapter kind of persists of, um, kind of builds off this. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Does that sound familiar? 
It's actually what Jesus pointed to in the New Testament when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he says in Matthew 22, 37 through 38, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. This helps show us that our obedience to God should come from love. Jesus quoted the Shema when he was responding to a Pharisee who was trying to trap him by asking him, which, which, which of God's commands is the greatest? And Jesus is calling out his hypocrisy here, saying that the law isn't about this mere legalistic adherence, but rather obedience should come from love for the Lord, who chose to set his heart in love on us such that we would desire to glorify him. The heart, soul, and mind here, they collectively represent the whole person. One should love God with a total love and devotion with all of oneself. And Deuteronomy 6 is called the Shema because that's the Hebrew word that it opens up with. When it says, hear, O Israel, it's actually Shema, O Israel. And this word Shema means, uh, to, it means to hear in such a way that you would pay attention to and learn and understand such that you would act in response to what is heard. What is it we are supposed to hear and act upon? It is to love God with all our heart and all our soul and all our might. And when we do that, actually, chapter 6, verse 6 says, these words that I command you shall be on your heart. Why? Because we love the Lord with everything. It's what we see in our passage in Deuteronomy 12, why loving him seems to be almost synonymous with walking and fearing and serving and so on. Because when we love God in that sort of way, we desire to walk and fear and serve. And to keep moving in verse 13, and to keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord which I am commanding you today for your good. Here's the theme we're going to see all throughout our passage today. It's an emphasis on keeping the commandments of God from a place of love, an overflow of the heart. And Moses says here, it's for your good. We're going to return to that point a little bit later toward the end. But note those first two verses that we just went over, they're kind of a summary of what we'll see throughout the rest of our passage, a summary that harkens back to Deuteronomy 6. So keep moving with me. We're going to start to see a cycle in the text here that's going to show us this pattern. It starts with God in verse 14. It says this, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens and the earth and all that is in it. Remember how we've learned the last couple of weeks uh, how Genesis 1-1, when it says God created the heavens and the earth, it's a way of saying everything, it all belongs to God. Moses is trying to give Israel a big picture of who creator God is. The God of whom David said in Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babies and infants. You have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what does it cause David to ask? What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? That's the God we're talking about. And that's the thought that this verse should give us. That's what Moses is trying to get the Israelite people to feel. This is who God is by saying, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of the heavens and the earth and all that is in it. That's who creator God is. And because he made it all, it all belongs to him. There's no reason that that God, who is categorically wholly set apart other than us, there's no reason that God should be mindful of us. And yet, verse 15, yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples as you are this day. He 
chose to set his heart in love on Israel's fathers and the hearers right now as their offspring. He had determined to bless them and had promised to do so. The Bible word for this is he made a covenant with them above all peoples. Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 8 helps give even more color to this. It says this. It was not because you were more in number than any of the other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. So it says, it's not because you were great in human terms. Rather, for you were the fewest of all peoples. Then why did God choose them? It's this. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. He chose the Israelites, lowest of peoples, because he loved them and is faithful to his covenantal promises. He acts in accordance with his eternal power and nature. And when he promises, he acts accordingly. When he speaks, things happen. His promises are a result of his character. And so when it says he chose them here, it's like saying he will do what he promises because his choice comes out of his own goodwill and pleasure and nature. All right, let's keep reading. Let's read that verse again because it's going to help us as we go into verse 16. Verse 15, yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their, note, he chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples, as you are this day. Now, this offspring language would have been a key word that it would have drawn the Jewish reader's mind back to Genesis 17, 9 through 14, where God instituted circumcision as his covenant sign for Abraham and his offspring. And even further back to the promise of Genesis 3, 15, where God promised that the offspring of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. So it's drawing back upon where God's covenant with Israel began. It's showing them that he'd been faithful to his covenant. And it's reminding them of the original sign of that covenant, which was circumcision. Which is why when verse 16 comes in, it doesn't come out of nowhere when God says, verse 16, when he says, circumcise therefore, Moses speaking to the Israelites, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, And be no longer stubborn. This is Moses compelling the people. Don't just mindlessly adhere to these rituals and commands. But do it out of love. Change your heart stance. Change it because God has chosen you. He set his love on you. And he's promised his blessing. Here, circumcision symbolizes removing the stubbornness that prevents the heart from properly loving God. And quick side note, this is a command that is beyond any human capability to fill. This is a change in heart, and only God can do that by his spirit. Israel needs a heart change. So to recap the last three verses, here's what we've seen. Creator God who, knows, who owns everything in verse 14, verse 15, He set his heart on you in love, verse 16. Therefore, follow his commands from your own heart. We'll continue to see the same pattern throughout our passage. This is who God is. This is what he's done. Therefore, love him. Follow his commands. Image him. Glorify him. All right, verse 17. We'll see this cycle again. It starts with God. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. This is all pointing to him being all-powerful God. When it says, who is not partial, he takes no bribe, it's pointing to the fact that he's perfectly just. There are no flaws in his ways. He is good, holy. In every way, he is other than us. That God, he, verse 18, he executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Meaning, he cares for the lowest of peoples, the most neglected. The word sojourner here means 
this temporary resident or simply an outsider, God loves those who can't reciprocate his love. It's a selfless love. This is who your God is. And because this is who God is, verse 19, love the sojourner, therefore. Do this because God does this. Imitate him or image him. Notice God does this out of his perfect character and nature. Therefore, you do this. Consider our question from a couple weeks ago where we asked how and why did God create us? And our answer, God created us male and female in his own image to love him, live with him, glorify him, and it is right that we who were created by God should live to his glory. We were created in God's image to glorify him. And how do we do this? Well, in a sense, and what I want you to see here, in a sense by imaging him rightly. In the commentary connected to that question a couple weeks ago, John Piper said this. He makes humans in his image to image something, namely himself. So our existence is about showing God's existence. Or specifically, it's about showing God's glory. Which I think means God's manifold perfections, the radiance of the display, the streaming out of his many colored, beautiful perfections. We want to think and live and act and speak in such a way that we draw attention to the manifold perfections of God. We'll circle back to the second half of that quote later. But notice right now what John Piper is pointing out. In imaging God's character rightly, in showing his nature, we glorify him. God loves, so we ought to love. That's what we're seeing in our passage here. God's commandments and his law are just an extension of who he is, his character. So to follow his commands is to imitate him, to image him, to glorify him. This is what we should do. All right, back to our passage. Verse 19 again. Love the sojourner, therefore. For you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. He delivered you, Israel, is what he's saying. You needed my love and grace, Israel. So do the same for others. They were sojourners. Verse 20. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. And by his name you shall swear. Which is a phrase that simply means to swear loyalty, hope, trust in God alone. Again, notice verse 17. I am God of gods and Lord of lords. Verse 18. Yet I love the sojourners. Like you, Israel. Verse 19 and 20. Therefore, you love. Fear, serve, hold fast, swear by him. All right, verse 21, our cycle repeats one more time. He is your praise. He is your God who has done these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. I love how this gets even more personal here. He is your God. He is your praise. You have seen his power personally, up close. He has chosen you, Israel. This God, verse 22, dives into a short story to remind them of his covenantal promises. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons. And now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. He's been faithful to his covenant promises. This is a call back to Genesis 5, uh, 15, 5, where God says to Abraham, look toward the heaven and number the stars, if you're able to, so shall your offspring be. So God has been totally faithful to his covenantal promises, promises that Abraham believed and are now being fulfilled. And now, verse 1 of chapter 11, final verse we'll cover today. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. If you love him from your heart, you will seek to follow his commands. They go together. In fact, those were the very words of Jesus, John 14, 15. He says, if you love me,
you will keep my commandments. So, how can we glorify God? Love him. If you do that, you'll want to obey him by following his commands. Live a life to follow him, to look like him, to image him as you were created to do. Such a life is making much of God. And that's our purpose. That's our good. And that's to God's glory. So how does this truth apply to us today? We have three application points we're going to work through. Application number one, believe and embrace that glorifying God is for your good. Believe and embrace that glorifying God is for your good. Let me ask, do you believe the truth that glorifying God is for your good? God asks us to love him, serve him, follow his commands, glorify him. It says, for your good. Remember verse 13? Moses is, challenges the Israelites by essentially saying, has God asked too much of you? Is it a problem that he's asked you to love him and follow his commands? Has God not required these things of you for your good? Well, of course God required them for their good. Since when has following God's commands not been for the good of those who follow them? My papa, my mom's dad, would always say, it's not right because God said it, but God said it because it's right. And the truth he was communicating is that we don't serve a God who commands without reason. Rather, he wants what's best for us. And so he tells us what is right because he loves us and deserves our obedience. And that's why God gives us his commands. That's why he asks us to glorify him. Because our good and his glorification are intimately tied up with one another. This is just two biblical truths coming together. Romans eleven thirty six says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. It was all made for him and to his glory. And yet, just three chapters earlier in Romans, Romans 8, 28, a verse many of us know well. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. His purpose that we would glorify him. Both of these truths are, both of these are absolutely true. And such realities must intimately be tied up with one another. How? Let's jump to the second half of our John Piper quote from earlier. He's talking about imaging God in a way that brings him glory. And he says, And I think the way we do that best is by being totally satisfied in those perfections ourselves. Meaning God's perfections. They mean more to us than money and more to us than fame and more to us than sex or anything else that might compete for our affections. And when people see us valuing God that much and his glory being that satisfying, they see that he is our treasure. Show me more. I think that is what it means to glorify God by being in his image. So, we best glorify, we best image him when we believe and embrace that glorifying God is for our good. What greater gift could God give us than himself? He indeed is our praise. And contrary to con conventional wisdom, it isn't egotistical, but rather it's selfless and loving and merciful for a holy, perfect God to create you to worship himself because he knows that in worshiping him, you will experience satisfaction and fulfillment that you will find nowhere else. Oh, how kind is our God. C.S. Lewis said, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. He goes on and quotes the Scott Catechism, which says that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But we shall then know that these are the same thing. Fully to enjoy is to glorify. 
and commanding us to glorify him, God is inviting us to enjoy him. Oh, what a gift that we have been invited to glorify God, to enjoy God. And in doing so, we glorify him. Believe and embrace this truth today. Application point number two, be humbled that God chose you. Be humbled that God chose you. Notice three times in our passage, it points to who God is in order to humble us to who we are, that we might respond in a heartfelt, loving obedience to God's commands. Verse 14, here's creator God. Verse 15, he set his heart on you. He loved you. He chose you. Oh, what a humbling thought. Or verse 17, perfect, powerful ruler and owner of all. Verse 18, loved and cared for the fewest of all people, you. Oh, how undeserving we are. Or again in verse 21, the God who calls you his own. Verse 22, he's been faithful to you. Oh, how gracious he is. If we are not at least a little bit humbled, though we ought to be humbled altogether, we hold things in totally wrong perspective. Might you need to change your perspective today and humble yourself before the God of the universe. Our final application point, be driven to glorify God from your heart. Be driven to glorify God from your heart. Friends, God desires our hearts. When Moses tells Israel in verse 16 to circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn, it's him saying that the command of circumcision goes beyond mere legalistic adherence to what they were supposed to do. But God wants their hearts to love and want to serve him as opposed to being stubborn. The good news is that God is in the business of softening stubborn hearts. As we saw, God is faithful in his character and his promises. That's why we can glorify him. Might you need to pray this morning that he would soften your heart to love and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments. Now, in closing, we will always fail at the task of glorifying God. We can never fully glorify God. We'll never do it perfectly. But Jesus did. Jesus' desire was to bring full glory to God, and he did it. Right before he went to the cross, in John 12, 27, he says, And now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. That's why we sang that song earlier. In fact, Jesus is our model in this. We get to imitate him because he perfectly glorified the name of the Father. The idea is wrapped up in John 17, 4, where Jesus says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Friends, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law of God such that we can trust in his work. And only in doing that do we have any hope of glorifying God ourselves. For the strength to follow his commands is supplied by him that all glory may be to God. So friends, trust in the work of Christ who perfectly glorified the name of the Father. Let's pray together. Father, we want to fully know and enjoy you. Open our eyes to who you are such that we would be able to trust in you and long to follow your commands. Whether through small acts of kindness or bold acts of obedience, may we become a people who glorify you in everything. Orient our hearts toward Christ as the image of what this looks like. As the one in whom we can hope. 
Father, make us the people who bring glory to you in everything. We pray all in Jesus' holy name. Amen.